it can mean a tasarruf, fi shay, you know, sort of the sort of inter interaction or uh, um, uh, control of something. A lot of these, these are different, different meanings of the word. Tabarak uh, al-ladi bi yadihi al-mulku. You know, blessed is he in whose hands is the dominion. See, so, so it can take on a number of different possibilities, and as a result of that, uh, most of the scholars have the view that these verses fall in the category of the, um, the uh, allegorical, and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what's intended by them, although mainstream belief is that the outward meaning of these words is to be denied, and in terms of the actual interpretation of them, that's something we leave uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All we have to know is that what Allah says, uh, the, the actual, the outward meaning, the literal meaning of the word is not intended. Because if the literal meaning was intended, then that would mean that Allah is like his creation. Even though all throughout the Quran, there are a number of different places in the Quran where Allah re-emphasizes and reiterates that he is unlike uh, the creation. In Surah Al-Ikhlas, لَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And we're talking about muhkamat. These are clear verses and ambiguous verses. You know, there's nothing comparable to him. He has no uh, compliment. Uh, there's nothing like him. Uh, that also, La تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ أَمْثَالِ Do not strike similitudes for Allah or for God. So you find this in the Quran, that Allah is in ambiguous terms, making it clear that he's unlike anything. But then when we read these verses and we say, well, we're troubled. You know, about hands. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَإِكْرَامِ كُلُّ مَنْ عَلِيهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَإِكْرَامِ Everything, all upon it, meaning the earth, will perish and the face of your Lord will remain. So he attributes a face to himself. In the Quran, he attributes a, a side to himself. In the Quran, he attributes eyes to himself. You see, you find all these in the Quran, uh, these things are mentioned. And then some of the hadith, you find things like feet, you find fingers. All these things are mentioned in the hadith and the Quran, but they fall in the category of the mutashabihat. And this, this verse, what it fundamentally is saying is that those who have some type of perversity in their hearts, they're the ones who follow these type of verses, seeking discord and seeking their meanings, while none know their meaning except for Allah, period, period. So, so this particular aspect of allegorical or ambiguity, the allegorical ambiguity, is where we stop on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or we can even include the scholars into this Second possibility, too, and say that even for the allegorical ambiguity, Allah and the, those deeply rooted in knowledge know their meaning. Because Abdul, Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he was asked about some of these things, he says, I'm from those deeply rooted in knowledge, rooted in knowledge who know their meanings. Uh, but the difference between the two is that those who are deeply rooted in knowledge know it in general terms, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows specifically what he meant, he meant by what he meant. So meaning that the scholars, they know the language, they know the different possibilities, you see. They know the, possi they know the, type of the possibilities which are to be discarded, but then there are those others, uh, they say, well, this is possible, that's possible, that's possible. I think this may be the best one, but you know what? It doesn't really matter. I just know, as long as I negate that first one. But they have the, all, the, all the, the different possibilities in their brain, so they do know it. But it's not able to assign which one in particular of the different possibilities that God himself has uh, determined or intended when uh, he actually uh, uttered those, those words. So, so, so you can actually translate it uh, in that way also for the uh, allegorical ambiguity in that regard. So Ibn Abbas saying what he said, he said, I'm amongst those who are deeply rooted in knowledge, who know his interpretation, who know his meaning. Uh, and you find, in this, because of this, you find a number of different narrations where Abdullah ibn Abbas, anhuma, actually, uh, uh, he, he, he actually, he made a point to say that 
with regard to these severed letters of the different surahs, said they have meaning. And if anything, uh, the only problem is that we don't know how to put them together in the right formation. And, but for those who can put them together in the right formation, we'll be able to be able to discover what they actually mean. So have you not seen that in some surahs Allah said, Alash Lam Ra, and then he said, Hamim, and in one surah he says, Noon, and all of that together spells Ar-Rahman, if you put them all together. So he, said, so he gives that as an example of what he means by uh, these huruf maqatta'a having meaning. And actually the majority of the scholars, the overwhelming majority of the scholars, believe that these huruf have a meaning, they have an interpretation, except that they, many of them, or if not most of them, have uh, refrained from trying to mention any possibilities, uh, except that you do find them in some of the books of tafsir, such as, you know, the Arabs sometimes would abbreviate, and this is another translation for huruf maqatta'a, the abbreviated letters. Uh, they, they would speak uh, to a person and they would request something from them and they would say the first letter of the word and they, it would be simply be understood as sort of an idiom. So for instance, a poet, a uh, famous poet, in speaking about uh, a particular woman who had, he sort of fell uh, head over heels uh, for, and he says, uh, I said to her, stop. And she said to me, you stop. But she said, qaf. She didn't say qif, she said qaf. And qaf is just one letter of the word qif. And so, but he understood from it that it has a particular meaning. And this is why sometimes you find that some of the scholars will uh, say, translate Yasin as Ya Insan. Yasin means Ya O Man, meaning the Prophet, وسلم, meaning that is one of his names. Yasin. O Yasin, Wal Quran and Hakim, Innaka Lamin al Mursarin. Indeed, you are amongst the, those who have been sent. So that's why he starts off, Yasin. He's calling, he's summoning Muhammad. So that is an example. Taha, you know, all of you find these are some of those possibilities. But the point being that we can never say for certainty what exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant by them, but we do acknowledge that they do have meaning. Now, in terms of some of the different uh, um, factions before we uh, open things up, inshallah, some of the different factions in, t in terms of the interpretations of these particular uh, types of verses you find, for instance, one faction referred to as the Ismailiya, and, and not all of them, but some, uh, the Ismailiya, Baltiniya, the, uh, uh, the mystic, uh, sort of mystical um, followers of the Ismaili sect, which is a branch or a break off, a splinter group from the Shi'i, from the Shia, uh, that they employed a particular hermeneutic where Whereas they would say that uh, every likuli dahir baatin wal baatinu hu al haq that every uh, outward meaning or literal or word that is has a pseudo explicit uh, um, signification it also has a, a a a figurative interpretation and the same thing for those which are univocal. That any verse, that every single word and verse in the Quran, although having an outward meaning that it, it points to, it has a subtle hidden meaning. Uh, and that hidden meaning is what actually is understood, or what the truth is. That's where the truth is, in that he hidden meaning, not in the outward meaning. Which we know is, can be problematic, you see. And, and likely is the reason that when we reflect upon the Amman message that we spoke about during the first class, that when the scholars talked about the eight schools that noticeably they did not include amongst the eight schools the Ismaili sect. Uh, and they also didn't include the Ahmadiyya uh, amongst the, the eight schools 